Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. We're celebrating teachers on the show tonight. Educators and school leaders are a central component of the classrooms that will have to be redesigned for the COVID-19 crisis. Now joining us on the line to help highlight the critical role that teachers play in the response to and in the recovery from the pandemic, we have Jennifer Lassimbang, Assistant Minister of Education and Innovation in Sabah. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on the show this evening. Now, uh, can you begin by telling us what has been the most most significant impact of the lockdown on teachers and the school system in Sabah? Um, thank you, Melissa. I think uh, teachers, especially all of us, are having a hard time during this MCO. But I think teachers, especially those who are teaching uh, in rural and remote schools in Sabah and some island uh, community schools, really they are facing the challenge of ensuring that the learning and facilitation process to run smoothly. Uh, over the MCO period. And I think because in Sabah, 70% of our students are living in the rural, some very remote communities on islands and plantations, um, not only they do not have efficient or adequate uh, internet access, but um, they don't have access to even gadgets like uh, computers, smartphones, mobile devices at home uh, for them to, uh, you know, to access to the online teaching and learning session. Can I, can I ask you uh, specifically about uh, the, the rural and marginal communities? I understand that uh, in the last budget allocation for, by the federal government, there was money to be poured into uh, dilapidated schools, upgraded dilapidated schools. And I believe uh, Sabah and Sarawak received over, 100, so over 700 million ringgit in allocations. Now with the change in federal government, uh, are those uh, funds still going to be going to uh, Sabah in particular uh, to deal with those dilapidated schools yes the um, the budget that were approved we really hope that after the MCO period is over we're looking very hopefully that we will be able to fix the many schools uh, more than 500 dilapidated and almost a hundred schools that was already be declared unsafe uh, in, in Sabah so we shouldn't Put, putting the politics behind, we should really move forward and we need to fix all the schools for the students to have a safe learning space. Okay, so you mentioned that 70% of students in Sabah are in rural and remote areas. Now, I'm wondering, um, has the design of the COVID response in terms of teaching and learning taken into consideration some of these uh, material and cultural realities of the inequalities on the ground? Okay, um, taking into that consideration, uh, I know that the teachers are doing their very best. They're trying to be innovative, creative, um, in some very dire situation where there's absolutely no internet access at all. Uh, the teachers are using whatever resources they, they have to ensure that the teaching and learning process continues. And I think one of my biggest, uh, one of the things that we can uh, look at is the different, even literacy level and the knowledge and skills of parents um, and, of course, their immediate family will greatly influence how they, they can support the home learning. And we also look at um, how, you know, I'm very worried about children with disabilities and also children with uh, parents with disabilities will definitely find it very difficult to support their children's learning at home. Uh, what, what about the, the role of the state government then? In, because you seem to have maybe a, a deeper sense of what is happening on the ground. Uh, how does the state government play a role? I mean, what exactly is it supplying teachers in order to fill the gaps uh, that you just uh, pointed to? Um, at that level, we, of course, we work very closely with the um, Department of Education in Sabah. Ultimately, education is under the purview of Ministry of Education Malaysia. But we are here in Sabah to support whatever um, the teachers or any of the education sector need 
in terms of support and we're here to listen and we're looking at um, giving the right input for example we know that the internet access is one of the biggest uh, you know drawback and maybe perhaps we can explore other ways um, or other method of delivering a home learning to uh, areas where there's absolutely no internet access and it will not be available uh, in a very near future but maybe we can come up with um, you know innovative ideas like uh, using radio for example to deliver um, education so we are here to look at and of course we have the ground um, experience on uh, what is happening in Sabah. So, so apart from the internet issues, the connectivity issues uh, and the, the quality internet, what are the teachers telling you? I mean, you, you say you're listening to the teachers in Sabah. What is it that teachers need, um, need the most? Is it, is it training? Is it resources? What kind of support are they asking for? Yeah, I think while my, uh, many of the teachers, they do have the additional skills to produce like, for example, e-learning materials. Um, but some of them, they might be even stuck in locations that probably went home just before the MCO was enforced. And uh, where they are, they might not have the materials nor the equipment to create or publish their own uh, online lesson. I mean, everybody is taken by surprise with this and nobody is that prepared. Uh, but of course, the teachers wouldn't have enough time to um, basically migrate the whole learning into an online platform. Uh, but of course, um, there's many areas that teachers are trying their best, like some of them, instead of uh, relying on the online home learning, uh, some of them, they have to print, uh, basically print out and deliver um, assignments and uh, workbooks and actually some of them, they need to go through very difficult terrain to actually deliver this to their students. And um, they have been contacting the grassroots leaders like the MPKKs or the village heads to help them deliver the materials to the students and then um, pick them up and send it back to the school or the teachers concerned. So uh, everybody's trying to cope here with the, what, what, whatever is happening in, in our, our space. I wonder, though, you know, it seems like maybe in many rural areas, uh, the, the, the virus might not actually be present. I mean, many green areas might uh, allow for schools to return to a normal, uh, you know, ordinary and conventional ways of teaching. Uh, what's your sense of the timeline for a return and what kind of areas might move more quickly into their back into the normal mode and where areas and areas where things might have to change more radically? Okay, we we know this, uh, that the, most of the rural areas are not affected, but we, we just can't take any chances. I mean, the, you know, education we can delay, but we can't take any chance of just like, okay, being complacent and say, okay, with the green area, there's no... But we as the person coming into the communities, we might be the one bringing the virus and... But I think we just have to comply. We just have to know, talk to parents right now and uh, asking them, are you nervous about your children not being able to access to the normal education? And they, they said, you know, what is half a year or a year not in the, the usual school setup? Right. Uh, rather, we do not want our ch kids to be exposed. Um, let's teach them some other things to learn, like life skills, for example, let them touch the ground, let them do some gardening, uh, let's teach them different something, uh, another, another, um, yeah. what do you call it? Other Aspect skills, right? I yeah. Actually, I love yeah. that, Jennifer. I, I really, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm wondering yeah. whether this, you know, this crisis is actually, there's an opportunity for us to rethink education. Is there room for creative responses in the way we've been approaching rote uh, learning? I think it's the best way for us to rethink. I mean, technology has always been there for us to use, but it also creates gaps not just gaps between the rural and remote communities, but even within the urban setting, you know, the rich and poor will have different uh, access or we say benefit or advantage or things like that. And that's why I was thinking of using 
we need to look at other ways of what exactly is education. Yes, um, not uh, going out of the way and not looking at the formal need to know, writing, reading and counting, but we also need to relook at what is it because the needs in the rural communities are very different from the needs for, for the urban children. And I think this is the best time, yeah? Uh, basics of education is there, the formal, but I think we, this, um, this uh, Corona-19, COVID-19 and the MCO have given us a time to look at, and parents actually. Um, I'm a mom to a nine-year-old and I've never felt so hopeless in teaching my own <laughs> child <laughs> math. <laughs> Uh, we definitely appreciate teachers so much more after this MCO Absolutely. for sure. <laughs> Thank you so Absolutely. much for speaking with us uh, tonight. Yeah. YB Jennifer, appreciate your time. After this, we're going to be speaking to one of the teachers that inspired the film uh, Adiwiraku. Stay tuned to consider this. Mm -hmm.